Hello, it's Kelly, your instructor again. Welcome to week two of Nursing 111. We're going to talk about introduction to case care coordination and health teaching. <clears throat> so here we go. The agenda, we're going to talk a little bit about managed care, um, a decent amount about case management, uh, health care collaboration, uh, groups and group communication, therapeutic communication, which is really important, and we'll dive into that in a little more detail, and patient consumer education, which is huge, especially with um, patients or people that are a bit health care illiterate. Um, so let's begin. <clears throat> First of all, managing care terms. So we have managed care, which basically is just the delivery, the healthcare delivery system. Um, it's set up to decrease cost and improve outcomes. Um, case management, where somebody or a team uh, coordinates care of the patient over time using combination of health and social services, basically to meet the needs of that individual. Patient-focused care, a delivery model that organizes healthcare around the expressed physical and emotional needs of a patient, and differentiated care, um, in which uh, each nurse's educational preparation and skill sets are evaluated to determine how best to use a particular nurse. Uh, we have three things here, shared governance, case method, or total care, and functional method. Um, in shared governance, um, members of the nursing staff participate with the administration personnel in making, implementing, and evaluating patient care policies. This is kind of a general overall in an organization. Um, case method. Um, one nurse provides some patient-centered care and is responsible for, uh, now let me back up. In the case method or total care, a uh, patient-centered method where one nurse is assigned to and is responsible for the comprehensive care of a certain group of patients, like maybe diabetics in a group, um, COPD, people, and stuff like that. Functional method, uh, where it focuses on the jobs to be completed as part of the care team. So there are a lot of different aspects to that. A um, couple of terms, uh, primary nursing, where one nurse is responsible for overseeing um, care of a patient 24 hours a day, seven days a week, even if not directly responsible for care, like in a group home for disabled people. Uh, team nursing, where you have a registered nurse or a licensed practical nurse or unlicensed assistive personnel. Um, so kind of a group like a RN, CNA group with a group of patients. Some concepts related to nursing care. Um, first, we have advocacy, and nurses advocate for patients' rights and protection from harm, uh, vital in certain healthcare settings to empower and educate patients. Uh, clinical decision making that involves prioritizing actions based on the patient assessment data prevent duplication of services, uh, which cut, cuts cost, and helps prevent, um, I already said that, uh, communicate goals and manage time efficiently. Communication is a huge deal, and we'll be talking about that soon in more detail. Crucial for care team collaboration, ensuring con continuity and avoiding redundancy. 
again, um, cost cutting for the healthcare system. Uh, nurses facilitate team communication, educate patients, and address their concerns. Then we have ethics, and I think you covered ethics pretty well last term. <coughs> Ethical principles guide resource allocation and service delivery. Nurses uphold values such as trustworthiness, promote well-being, fairness, and, like doctors, do no harm. Then we have the healthcare system, or healthcare systems, involves coordinating services, managing resources, and controlling cost. Nurses work with, within guidelines to promote comprehensive care, requiring adaptability and creativity. And then teaching and learning. We're gonna talk a lot about teaching and learning towards the end of this. Patient education is vital for maintaining health and preventing complications. Uh, nurses primary are primarily responsible for patient teaching, reducing costs, and mentoring less ex experienced staff. All right, so that's managed care. Let's talk about case management. Um, this describes a range of models um, that healthcare systems integrate for individuals and groups. Uh, there are key responsibilities, assessing the patients at their home and communities, uh, coordinating planned or coordinating and planning patient care in either of these settings, collaborating with other people in the healthcare system, dietitians, um, providers, uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, etc., and monitoring patients' progress and evaluating patient outcomes from certain implementations. Um, and there's care management, mo management model. We won't talk a lot about that. Similar to case management, but focuses more on populations of people or patients instead of individuals. The goal is to integrate a, career, a continuum of clinical services and con concerned with promotion, uh, health promotion, disease prevention, cost control, and the wise use of resources. And here's an example of clinical pathway, and this is in your reading as well. I'll just keep it here for a few minutes, or a few seconds. Okay, moving on. All right, the nurse as a case manager. I don't have much written here, but I'm going to lecture on certain roles and what it means to be the nurse as a case manager. <coughs> Sometimes it's a social worker, but we're going to talk about nursing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, first of all, the nurse as a case manager. Um, case management varies across healthcare settings. Uh, nurse case managers, often RNs, are 89% of the cases. Um, usually there's a certification requirement, including academic and experiential criteria. So they should have been a nurse for a while. A role of the case manager, or the role of the nurse as a case manager, uh, coordinating all aspects of care for particular patients or groups, advocate for patients throughout their care journey, plan strategies to address individual patient problems, uh, varies by facility and unit, um, involving patient care facilitation, interprofessional team collaboration, and outcome monitoring. It's like if something isn't working well, do you want to continue to do the same implementation for care? Probably not. You want to switch it up a little bit. Skills required. A clinical decision making and critical thinking skills are vital. Assess patients holistically and maximize independence and quality of life. Remember last week, 
we talked about quality of life being one of the most important aspects of chronicity. Identify and address potential coordination challenges and then meet those. Ensure care follows standard protocols and evidence-based guidelines. And we have care plan development, identify actual and potential problems, assess potential coordination challenges related to religious practices, cultural beliefs, that's important, or complementary approaches, and develop care plans in consultation with patients and caregivers, and use care plans as a framework for coordination. I believe you'll be doing an in-depth care plan this term. <coughs> Excuse me. Coordination and communication. Um, and I'm trying not to say um as much. Initiate consultation with interprofessional terms or teams and obtain necessary orders. Update the care plan as consultations and referrals are implemented. Maintain ongoing communication with the patient's family's healthcare team. Monitor plan execution, make adjustments as you need, and revise the care plan as necessary. Document the original care plan and any modifications. And remember, if you don't document, it didn't really happen. So a few key elements here. Um, organize patient care by major diagnosis or diagnostic or diagnosis related groups, DRGs. Identify expected outcomes within a defined time period. Coordinate interprofessional care to achieve expected outcomes. Ensure care aligns with legal and ethical practices or standards. Promotes best practices and cost effectiveness utilizes principles of continuous quality improvement. And sometime in your journey, you'll learn that. Another key element is active involvement from admission. <clears throat> Case managers should be actively involved in admissions, regardless of care setting, inpatient, outpatient, or home, or community. Identification of need for case management is another one. Um, need often identified for patients with high volume or high risk diagnosis. High risk case includes patients with multiple comorbidities, so multiple illnesses or um, chronic illnesses, long acute care stays, or requiring ventilator support or home health care. And a few elements for successful case management, qualified case manager, dedicated interprofessional team, organizational support at all levels, administration, medical, and support staff. Quality management systems in place um, and utilization of critical pathways for patient care. Collaboration. Now this is where two or more individuals work towards a common goal. Um, ANA standards of professional nursing practice, and I can't recall if you've learned this last term or not. Um, but number 10 talks about collaboration specifically, where nurses must be able to collaborate with other healthcare team members, as well as the patient as they conduct their nursing practice. All right, moving right along. Concepts of collaboration. Um, interpersonal collaboration improves patient outcomes. Um, to be successful, you need to develop skills in communication and teamwork, um, value roles and responsibilities of the other team, and work to establish 
mutual trust and respect. The nurse as collaborator. All right, there's a few things here. Um, so with patients, we empower patients in healthcare decisions, foster autonomy, and sets shared healthcare goals. In case you don't remember what autonomy is, autonomy is letting the patient um, kind of make decisions for themselves, but we help foster that. <clears throat> With peers, we share expertise and build trust and values each team member's contributions for quality care. With healthcare professionals, we recognize expertise other than ourselves, listen, share responsibilities, and engage in interprofessional collaboration. So with the professional nursing organizations, we collaborate within organizations, serve on committees, which helps uh, the overall picture, and advocates for nursing and healthcare in general. With legislators, provides expert input on healthcare legislation and collaborates for the public's best interest. One example would be nurse to patient ratios. I believe that's changed recently, but I can't recall right offhand. All right, so let's talk a little bit about conflict in the workplace. Um, incivility, um, that was my huge thing when I was a manager a number of years ago. I was trying to avoid that. So we have a few things here. We have intrapersonal conflict occurs within the individual. So intra, inside, stress or tension within, interpersonal conflict. Hopefully I didn't say communication last time. I probably did. So interpersonal conflict is between two or more individuals. Intergroup conflict, I think that's pretty obvious, um, between competition or a opposition to one another, inter-organizational conflict um, between two organizations existing in the one market. So let's talk a little bit in depth about this. So causes of conflict. Um, we want to understand the root cause of conflict. For effective resolution, conflict can originate from various sources. Like, you know, I think we've already talked about those briefly. Okay, so back to causes of conflict. So individual conflict resources or sources uh, stem from personal attributes, communication styles, and how individuals manage and respond to conflict. Difference, differences and aspects can lead to interpersonal tensions. Interpersonal conflict resources or sources include conflict uh, that can emerge between individuals due to various factors, including uncivil behavior, varying levels of support, differences in communication styles, disparities in education, and influence of generals, generational characteristics. Organizational conflict resources include conflicts that may arise within healthcare organizations due to factors such as ambiguity or uncertain about responsibilities, scope of practice disputes, issues related to organizational structure, and challenges in the work environment including high stress and constraints related to resources like staffing or budget limitations. The nurse-physician relationship, effective collaboration between the nurses and physicians is vital to provide the best possible patient care. However, this relationship can be strained by factors like the lack of confidence on the part of the nurses, 
fear of making mistakes or attempts to uphold traditional hierarchy or hierarchical structures within the healthcare settings. Addressing, excuse me, these issues with is crucial for maintaining harmonious and productive nurse physician partnership. The nurse patient relationship. Conflicts can arise between the nurses and patients or their families due to a range of factors. These may include patients or family members lacking essential knowledge about the, their condition or treatment, and that's pretty common. Having inadequate coping skills to manage stress or illness, experiencing fear or anxiety, that lead to frustration. <clears throat> nurses failing to assess and address patients' needs adequately. Effective communication and understanding are key to resolving these conflicts maintained a, and maintaining a positive nurse-patient relationship. I think one of the main important thing is a nurse-nurse relationship. Within the healthcare team, conflicts can arise between nurses and their co-workers potentially leading to workplace bullying or incivility. Preventing and managing these conflicts is essential to maintaining a healthy work environment. Strategies for achieving this include fostering open communication, mutual respect between the two, and creating a culture that values teamwork. Preventing conflict. Conflict prevention involves several proactive measures. These include, but are not limited to, recognizing signs of tensions and negative behaviors early on, promptly addressing emer emerging situations or issues, promoting continuous learning and accountability among team members, establishing clear expectations for roles and responsibilities, and implementing stress reduction strategies. These measures help create a work environment that minimizes conflict triggers. Conflict management styles. These include individuals have different ways of responding to um, conflicts. These styles can range from competitive or assertive to collaborative collaborative, compromising, avoiding, or accommodating. Conflict competence involves the ability to adapt to various styles depending on the situation, promoting effective conflict resolution and maintaining positive relationships. Responding to conflict. <clears throat> Excuse me. Responding to conflict. So effective communication or effectively addressing conflicts requires a thoughtful and constructive approach this involves being honest and objective in decisions or dis yeah dis discussions actively listening to all parties involved and focusing on finding a solution that prioritizes patient care by doing so conflicts can be resolved in a way that benefits everybody and managing, I think that's all we're going to say about that. All right. Okay, so let's talk about communication topics. We have group and therapeutic communication. All right, let's talk about group communication for a minute. Um, healthcare groups, uh, nurses often participate in a variety of healthcare groups, playing diverse roles as members or leaders, educators, learners, advisors, or advisees. These groups can encompass a range of purposes and structures with the common types, including committees or teams. Now, these groups typically have a defined purpose and structure, <clears throat> meeting regularly to address specific issues. Examples include policy committees, quality improvement committees, and rapid response teams. 
Now, leaders within these groups are experienced in the field and facilitate communication among members. Task force um, are temporary work groups performed for specific activities, such as accreditation preparations or health fairs. They function similarly to committees, but have limited duration of work. Teaching groups aim to impart information to participants encompassing topics like continuing education or patient healthcare education. Nurses leading these groups must be skilled in teaching learning process. We'll talk about that later. Self-help groups um, compromising or comprising individuals sharing common health issues. Help or self-help groups operate on the principles that helping others with similar struggles can be therapeutic, including examples include Alcoholics Anonymous and cancer survivor groups. There are a couple of others, but we won't get into that for time. Therapeutic communication. Um, and we're going to dive into that pretty good. Um, here are two therapeutic communication and therapeutic relationship. So the therapeutic relationship, it's patient focused. So we want to seek to trust and understand between the nurse and the patient. Um, respect. We want to consider their ethic, their ethnic, cultural, and family values. And privacy and confidentiality. You want to respect the patient's modesty, privacy, and confidentiality, obviously. Uh, patient well-being. Um, that just basically centers on the patient's well-being and mutual trust and acceptance. A few phases. Um, we have the pre-interaction phase. So gathering initial patient information. And let's see, introductory phase. So establishing trust and helping the patient feel safe. Work phase, we, we, where we identify problems and treatment plans, empathizing, empathy, respect, and genuineness. And then the termination phase, concluding the relationship and possibly through transition or follow-up support. We want to develop this. Uh, we help identify feelings. And we assess the patients in recognizing and expressing their, feel, their emotions. We want to be honest and not sugarcoat anything. Be genuine and credible. Um, use ingenuity. So be creative when you're achieving goals. <clears throat> be culturally sensitive. Uh, recognize cultural differences in communication. And maintain confidentiality and no roles and limitations. All right. so. We have a couple more minutes left, and we have a, a good amount to talk about here, so we'll try to make it relatively quick. All right, so we're going to talk about teaching environments. Uh, that includes acute care hospitals, physician practice and clinics, uh, physician or urgent care centers, patient homes, extended care facilities, and community settings like library, schools, community health centers. Teaching individual patients, the goal is to improve patient and family health, utilize learning theories, change process and evidence-based approach. Following nursing process of assessment, planning, implementation, and evaluating, um, setting up individualized teaching plans. On one teaching um, occurs during direct patient care. Examples would be like wound care, instructions for post-operative patients, and diabetes management education. Uh, may include educating the family members or support support people. Uh, preparation for teaching would include coordinating a suitable teaching time with the patient. 
Create a comfortable, distraction-free environment. Deliver instructions in small segments in their language, periodically assessing the patient's response. Adapt the teaching plan based on the patient's reaction and address, and address any confusions that may come up. Expect the need for, for, for repetition, so repeating yourself. Assess the patient's abilities through return demonstration or teach back. And teaching the communities, or teaching in the communities. Uh, settings would be school, health departments, community resources, colleges, and universities. Opportunities for large group education. Uh, topics could include CPR, nutrition, weight management, uh, safety programs, or small group sessions can focus on preoperative education, childbirth classes, infant care, and dementia care. Developing a teaching plan. So individual patients, a health history, a physical and psychological assessment, support systems like transportation or caregivers, uh, factors affecting learning, readiness, motivation, comprehensive or com comprehension, and mobility. Group settings um, consider residents' primary language, age, sex, age and development level, I determine the patient's age to guide teaching strategies, assess developmental level through observation and conversation, understand the health problems of the patient, ask the patient to explain their health problems and its impact on their life, suggest additional services if needed, health beliefs and practices, uh, consider the patient's health beliefs in teaching plan. So you want to incorporate what they believe about that as much as you can. Recognize that changing beliefs is not the nurse's role. Cultural factors include incorporate or cultural factors. Incorporate cultural practices and values into teaching. Respect the patient's choice to follow cultural practices, even if it's different than yours. Economic Factors, um, consider patient's socioeconomic status when planning education, recognize limitations in financial resources, learning styles, um, identify patient's learning style, was it, is it visual, reading, hands-on, or in groups. Uh, vary teaching methods to accommodate different styles Support systems include uh, identify family or support systems uh, who need to learn alongside the patient. Using physical examination, observe cognitive status, mobility, nutrition status, energy during physical examination, assess sensory status, vision and hearing. Let's see, for time, let's move on. Identify the patient's learning needs. Um, learning needs linked to a primary concern or problem, reduce or resolve the issue. Examples would be teaching the patient to administer insulin for diabetic management. Learning needs in this context can be identified as educational requirement, education need, or need for teaching. Desire to learn is kind of big, uh, can also indicate a primary concern for learning. Non-compliance or non-adherence may be used when a patient has difficulty following the care plan due to various factors, but not cognitive deficits or conscious refusal of care. Learning needs as a response to health alterations. Teaching is necessary in response to problems arising from health alterations. These examples include potential for low fluid volume, inability to safely ambulate, and difficult with self-care. Establishing a teaching plan. Um, use the nursing process as a guide. Utilize the nursing process as a guide to develop teaching plan. Patient participation is important. Involve the patient in developing the, the teaching plan. 
um, patient's involvement increases likelihood of stressful outcomes. Prioritize learning based on the assessment or assessments. Consider both nurse and patient priorities. Address the patient priorities first. Theoretical frameworks like Maslow's hierarchy of needs can assist in setting priorities. Setting learning outcomes, collaborate with the patient to establish desired learning outcomes. Characteristics of learning outcomes include stating patient behavior or performance, reflecting observable, measurable activities, including conditions or modifiers if needed. Specifying the time for learning outcomes. And let's, I think you can read the rest of that in your book for time. Implementing the teaching plan. Patient engagements. Uh, patient engagement is crucial to promoting learning and providing care delivery. The nurse should actively involve the patient in both teaching and the care process. Uh, preparation and reflection. Uh, reflect on changes required in the, the care plan. Consider the stages of the change patient's readiness, and potential hindrances. Guidelines for implementation include establish a rapport with the patient before teaching, build the patient's previous knowledge and experiences, or build on, consider the best time to teach or for teaching sessions based on the patient preferences, communicate clearly and concisely, ensuring Shared understanding, use layperson's language, avoiding medical jargon. Adjust the patient's or the teaching pace to the patient's comfort level. Ensure a conducive learning environment, utilize teaching aids, and there are many more special teaching strategies. Anticipatory guidance, provide information proactively considering the patient's characteristics. Patient contracting, developing agreements for patient independence and goal achievement. Group teaching, cost-effective teaching in groups with common needs. And the list goes on. Uh, moving to evaluating. So continuous and final assessment of what the patient has learned. Outcomes set during Planning guide, planning outcomes set during planning guide the evaluation process. Some methods for evaluating learning, return, demonstration, or direct observation of behavior, post-test or written ass assessments, oral questioning and checking understanding, patient self-reporting, affecting what affects learning. Cognitive learning doesn't guarantee effective learning. Assess the patient. Assess if the patient applies learned principles to their behavior. Encourage and support behavior change over time. You're going to document and written. And I think that's about it. Um, I think there's a focus on diversity section. Generally, immigrants have usually a little bit lower health literacy. Public initiatives intended to improve health literacy do not always reach immigrants. Helpful and informational pictograms, pictograms and, sign, and signs translated into multiple languages and use cultural mediators that understand the particular cultural or culture, improve health literacy and quality of care for the immigrant. And with that, that's it for week two. Uh, continue finishing all your reading and I'll see you soon.